So as it says here in the argument, book 12, uh, the angel continues from the flood to relate what shall succeed. And by degrees explain who the, that seed of the woman shall be, which was promised Adam and Eve in the fall. And now, so reference explicitly to Christ, his incarnation, death, resurrection, and ascension. All four things important, by the way. Um, and the, also the state of the church till his second coming. Adam greatly satisfied and re-comforted by these relations and promises descends the hill with Michael, wakens Eve who all this while had slept, but with gentle dreams composed to quietness of mind and submission, Michael in either hand leads them out of paradise. Now he has them in their, his hands. Right? He's not, he's not, he doesn't have a sword behind them. He's not pushing them out with a sword in their backs. He has them by the hand. There's even here, there's an element of, of grace. He, he, walking along with you hand in hand. It's, it's a sad event. You must go. You cannot stay. But all the same, there's an element of solidarity in simply the holding of hands, which we've seen already throughout the, the epic uh, is uh, symbolized in the, hand, the holding of hands. Uh, leads them out of paradise, the fiery sword waving behind them and the cherubim taking their stations to guard the place. Because it, it is a holy place, which they have made unholy through their actions. So as one who in his dirty baits at noon. Now again, at noon and baits, which means stops, stays. When you bait something, you put the thinking about fishing, you put the bait in the water and the, the bait just sits there in the water and you wait for the fish to come and then you pull it. Uh, Though bent on speed, so here the archangel paused betwixt the world destroyed and world restored. Well, why is that a suitable uh, place to stop? Well, because exactly this is Milton's grand theme. Paradise has lot, been lost, but paradise has also been regained. That's, that's why Milton chooses this juncture as well. It's an illustration of a covenant of the rainbow that comes out of it. We'll not do this again. It will not be general destruction. He renews his covenant, covenant, and if Adam ought, perhaps might interpose, then with transition sweet, new speech resumes. Thus, says Michael, thou hast seen one world begin and end, and man, as from a second stock, proceed. It's like the um, first creation and being a new creation. That's what that symbolizes again. Everything's a symbol and a sign or, or a type of what will come, the new birth. Uh, much, for, much thou hast yet to see, but I perceive thy mortal sight to fail. Objects divine must needs impair and weary human sense. Henceforth, what is to come, I will relate. So he can't see. It's not the case that God is wholly hidden from him, but it needs to, but he can't see it. It's, it's, it's hidden, and God needs to reveal it. And now, how is it going to be revealed? Well, through the ministry of angels. He will tell him what will come and the, the generations that will ensue. Thou therefore give due audience and attend this second source of men, while yet but few, and while the dread of judgment past remains fresh in their minds, fearing the deity, with some regard to what is just and right, shall lead their lives and multiply apace, laboring the soil, and reaping plenteous crop, corn, wine, or, and oil, and from the herd or flock, oft sac sacrifice in bullock, lamb, or kid, with large wine offerings poured, and sacred feasts shall spend their days in joy unblamed, and dwell long time, you know what, I didn't even plug this in, how annoying. So the audio is gonna be crummy. Oh, well. maybe it will be better. Henceforth, we shall see soon. Um, and dwell long time in peace by families and tribes under paternal rule, till one shall rise of proud, ambitious heart, who not content with fair equality, fraternal state, will arrogate dominion undeserved over his brethren, and quite dispossess concord and law of nature from the earth. Hunting, and men, not beasts, shall be his game, with war and hostile snare such as refuse subjection uh, to his empire tyrannous. A mighty hunter thence he shall be styled before the Lord. 
as in despite of heaven, or from heaven claiming second sovereignty. Sounds a lot like Satan himself, right? And from rebellion shall derive his name, though of rebellion others he accuse. He with, his, with a crew whom like ambition joins with him or under him to tyrannize, marching from Eden towards the west, shall find the plain wherein a black bituminous gurge boils out from the undercurrent, the mouth of hell, of brick and of that stuff they cast to build a city and a tower whose top may reach to heaven and get themselves a name, lest far dispersed in foreign lands their memory be lost, regardless whether good or evil fame. But God, who oft descends to visit men, unseen and through their habitations, walks to mark their doings. Them, beholding soon, comes down to see their city, ere the tower obstruct heaven towers, and in derision sets upon their tongues of various spirit to raise quite out their native language, and instead to sow a jangling noise of words unknown. Forthwith a hideous gabble rises loud among the builders, each to other calls, not understood, till hoarse, and all in rage as mocked they storm. Great laughter was in heaven, and looking down to see the hubbub strange and hear the din, thus was the building left ridiculous, and the work confusion named. Babel, Tower of Babel. Uh, note the uh, parallel here between what happens when Satan goes to announce his victory down in hell, and they, uh, his speech turns into hissing, and they in response hiss. Same sort of uh, structure or a parallel uh, happening. And obviously there are parallels between the construction of the Tower of Babel, which is what we have here, the, uh, and the uh, confusion of tongues that ensues recounted in uh, book 10 of, uh, or chapter 10 rather of Genesis, uh, and what happens with Satan. And again, for those of you who are with me in the uh, C.S. Lewis Tolkien course, uh, Lewis replicates that in that hideous strength, right? Where they, they are trying to build a modern day Tower of Babel in the uh, modern university and uh, trying to build up through science a sort of a way of becoming like gods and God uh, gives them over. He, they bring the heavens down upon themselves, Lewis says, and he gives them over to a spirit of confusion. They end up barking and making grunts and cries like animals. And then the animals rush in and run them through, etc., as well. Anyway, where to? Thus Adam fatherly displeased. Fatherly displeased. It gives a, it's not just that he's displeased, he's displeased as a father. These are my sons. What are they doing? Oh, execrable son, so to aspire above his brethren, to himself assuming authority usurped from God not given. He gave us only over beast, fish, fowl, dominion absolute. What right we hold by his donation, but man over men he made not lord, such title to himself reserving, human left from human free. But this usurper, his encroachment proud, stays not on man. To God his tower intends siege and defiance. Wretched man, what food will he convey up thither to sustain himself and his rash army? where thin air above the clouds will pine, his entrails gross and famish him of breath, if not of bread. So Adam himself pronounces judgment on his posterity and the posterity that he judges is that mankind is now presumed that the dominion mandate over the birds and the fowl and the fish and the beast also extends to mankind, which is not so. That dominion was never given. And so Milton, again, you can have this as a political reading, obviously. He will have in mind what Charles I claimed the divine right of kings. There is no such divine right. God's never given mankind this right to rule over his fellow image bearers. That's something that you've presumed upon yourself as if you were not part of the human race. Not so. To whom thus, Michael, justly thou abhorst that son, who on the quiet state of men such trouble brought. 
affecting to subdue rational liberty. Rational liberty, isn't that interesting? Yet no will withal, since thy original lapse, true liberty is lost, which always with right reason dwells twinned, and from her ha hath no individual being. Reason in man obscured or not obeyed, immediately inordinate desires and upstart passions catch the government from reason and to servitude reduce man till then free. Therefore, since he permits within himself unworthy powers to reign over free reason, God in judgment just subjects him from without to violent lords who oft as undeservedly enthrall his outward freedom. Tyranny must be, though to the tyrant thereby no excuse. So note here, there's a picture given of not only politics and how tyrannies arise and how they justly arise as a consequence of a, sort of a macrocosmic outworking of a microcosmic reality. Because man kind has not obeyed reason, has, has exercised his will not to do the right thing, but to follow his passions, so likewise will he be brought into bondage and servitude under other men, in tyranny, in political tyranny. Not right, but we no longer have that freedom which we originally had, and therefore tyrannies arise. This is an explanation for why they do. Not possible to avoid because of the corruption of human nature. But that's no excuse for the tyrants, he says, having said that. Okay, and if you go to C.S. Lewis's preface to Paradise Lost, he will talk about this as well, by the way. So have a look at Lewis's preface to Paradise Lost and his commentary on precisely this issue. Um, but Plato talks about it in, in The Republic, you know, how reason ought to rule over the passions uh, in, in a man, ideally ought to. Uh, the problem is that the ideal is never realized and can't be because of original sin. That doesn't mean we ought not to try to, because again, the free exercise of worship of God by a godly people is what God desires. And we bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven by so doing. Uh, we don't increase the sin. Anyway, yet sometimes, and here's where he leans into this, sometimes nations will decline so low from virtue which is reason, that no wrong but justice and some fatal curse annexed deprives them of their outward liberty, their inward lost. Witness the irreverent son of him who built the ark, who for the shame done to his father heard this heavy curse, servant of servants, on this victorious race, thus will this latter, as the former would. as the former world, rather, still tend from bad to worse, till God at last, wearied from their iniquities, withdraw his presence from among them and avert his holy eyes, resolving from thenceforth to leave them to their own polluted ways. And one peculiar nation to elect, to select here, rather, from all the rest, of whom to be invoked, a nation from one faithful man to spring, him on this side, Euphrates, yet residing, bred up in idol worship. Oh, that man, canst thou believe, should be so stupid grown, while yet the patriarch lived, who escaped the flood, as to forsake the living God and fall to worship their own work in wood and stone for gods. So he's speaking here of, um, obviously, Abraham's origins. And Terah, the father of Abraham, was an idolater even though he's a son of, uh, of Noah. Yet him God the Most High vouchsafes to call by vision from his father's house, his kindred and false gods, into a land which he will show him. And from him will raise a mighty nation and upon him shower his benediction so that in his seed all nations shall be blessed. He straight obeys, not knowing to what land, yet firm believes. I see him, but thou canst not. With what faith he leaves his gods, his friends, and native soil, Ur of Chaldea, 
passing now the ford to Haran, after him a cumbrous train of herds and flocks, and numerous servitude, not wandering, poor, but trusting all his wealth with God, who called him in a land unknown. Canaan now he attains. I see his tents, pitched above Shechem and the neighboring plain of Morah. There by promise he receives gifts to his progeny of all that land, from Hamath northward to the desert south, things by their names I call, though, not, though, uh, though yet unnamed, from Hermon east to the great western sea, Mount Hermon, yonder sea, each place, behold in prospect as I point them. So it's like uh, Galadriel's mirror, as it were. He's pointing into this and, you, and look, and I'll show you now. And then he looks and he sees the future. Uh, and then he can see them. He can't see them initially, but through the vision that is given to him by the angels, he, he can see this. And he gives an account of salvation history here. And the uh, time where the patriarch here, faithful Abraham, will call a son. Uh, a son and to his son, a grandchild leaves. Like him in faith, in wisdom and renown. The grandchild with 12 sons increased, departs from Canaan to a land hereafter called Egypt, divided by the river Nile. See where it flows, disgorging at seven mouths into the sea. To sojourn in that land, he comes invited by a younger son in time of dearth, a son whose worthy deeds raise him to be the second in that realm of Pharaoh, Moses, of course. There he dies, that is Joseph, and leaves his race growing into a nation, and now grown suspected to a sequent king who seeks to stop their overgrowth as inmate guests too numerous, whence of guests he makes them slaves inhospitably and kills their infant males till by two brethren, two brethren call Moses and Aaron, sent from God to claim his people from enthrallment, they return with glory and spoil back to their promised land. But first, the lawless tyrant who denies to know their God or message to regard must be compelled by signs and judgments dire. To blood unshed the rivers must be turned frogs, lice, and flies must all his palace fill with loathed intrusion and fill all the land. His cattle must have rot and murrain die. Blotches and blains must all his flesh emboss and all his people. Thunder mixed with hail, hail mixed with fire must rend the Egyptian sky and wheel on the earth, devouring where it rolls. What it devours not, herb or fruit or grain, a darksome cloud of locusts swarming down must eat and on the ground leave nothing green. Darkness must overshadow all his bounds, palpable darkness, and blot out three days. Last, with one midnight stroke, all the firstborn of Egypt must lie dead. Again, note the opposition. At noonday, Christ sins, or rather Adam and Eve transgress. Christ dies at midnight, the Egyptians lose theirs after three days of darkness. Christ has three hours of darkness. Again, the, lo, note the parallelism here. It's, met, it's intended in the text. It's intended for us to, to see this. Uh, Thus with 10 wounds, this river dragon tamed at length submits to his sojourners depart and oft humbles his stubborn heart. Um, note that he's reading here uh, from, from the Psalms in, in his interpretation of this, that uh, it, it's the dragon who's taking a blow here, as if the river were a dragon. Uh, Till in his rage pursuing whom he late dismissed, the sea swallows him with his host, but lets that, them let's pass as on dry land between true crystal walls, awed by the rod of Moses, so to stand divided. Oops till his rescue gain his shore. Such wondrous power God to his saint will lend, though present in his angel who shall go before them in a cloud and pillar of fire by day, a cloud by night, a pillar of fire to guide them in their journey and remove behind them while the obdurate king pursues. All night he will pursue, but his approach darkness defends between till morning watch. Then through the fiery pillar and the cloud, God looking forth will trouble all his host 
and craze their chariot wheels. When by command Moses once more his potent rod extends over the sea, the sea his rod obeys. On their embattled ranks the ra waves return and overwhelm their war. The race elect safe towards Canaan from the shore advance through the wild desert, not the readiest way, lest entering on the Canaanite alarmed war terrify them inexpert and fear return them back to Egypt, choosing rather inglorious life with servitude. For life to noble and ignoble is more sweet untrained in arms, where rashness leads not on. This also that shall they gain by their delay in the wild wilderness. There they shall found their government and their great senate choose. So what happens in the time of the wilderness? They learn about government, about human government according to God's plan. And the 12 tribes and there are rules and there are judges and there's a sort of whole judicial system laid down. How you will live your life under God. It's not like living under Egypt. And so the uh, writers in this period will ref reflect on the law of God given to Moses and talk about how it will influence how people hereafter should govern themselves. And in, uh, in common law, you will see our, the justices of the peace, including the supreme justices, have these funny old collars with the two uh, tassels hanging from their neck. I don't know if you've ever seen them. Uh, representing the two tablets of the law around their necks. Um, harking back to the Mosaic Code as a means of government. And will himself, a God from the Mount of Sinai, whose gray top shall tremble in heat ascending, will himself in thunder and lightning and loud trumpet sound ordain them laws, part such as appertain to civil justice, part religious rites of sacrifice, informing them by types and shadows of what destined seed to bruise the serpent by what means he shall achieve mankind's deliverance. So there are different types of laws. There are civil laws that are given, there are moral laws, and then there are ceremonial laws. And the ceremonial laws are those that point to Christ in particular. But all of the laws have a function and a use and ought to be used as such. But the voice of God to mortal leader is dreadful. They beseech that Moses might report to them his will and terror cease. He grants them their desire, instructed that to God is no access without mediator. So they learn they need a mediator, whose high office now Moses in figure bears. He represents the prophet. One day Christ himself will be the mediator who's also their prophet. He's going to be their prophet, he's going to be their priest, and he will be their king. But in the person of Moses, he will be a mediator in terms of his office as prophet. And he shall foretell in all the prophets in their age, the times of great Messiah shall sing. Thus laws and rights establish such delight God hath seen in men, obedient to his will that he vouchsafes among them to set up his tabernacle. And the tabernacle, as I've said to you last semester, when we looked at the Bible's literature, is very much modeled on Eden. Uh, there's a reading of Genesis 1 and 2 that sees a foreshadow of the tabernacle, which is now here brought about because that's the holy place on which God himself walked in their presence and they in his presence. And there's all sorts of signs of the tabernacle even before a tabernacle is, is created. But here it is now created, the holy one with mortal men to dwell. And one day when he becomes incarnate, he will be the tabernacle. Right? He'll pitch his tent amongst them. He will be the tabernacle of God in the presence of men. All these things are our typology. Um, I will skip over some of this because I am getting a little bit far into this. Um, but I won't want to go, let me come to, to David. Uh, unless you have questions about this. Uh, let, let's come to Adam's response to this uh, first. So Adam interposed, O oh, sent from heaven, 270, Enlightener of my darkness, gracious things thou hast revealed. Those chiefly which concern just Abraham and his seed. Now first I find mine eyes true opening and my heart much eased. Erewhile perplexed with thoughts, what would become of me and all mankind? But now I see 
his day, in whom all nations shall be blessed. Favor unmerited by me, who sought forbidden knowledge by forbidden means. This yet I apprehended, I apprehend not. Why to those among whom God will deign to dwell on earth, so many and so various laws are given, so many laws argue so many sins among them. How can God with such reside? Such people that have so many sins that require so many laws, how can God uh, suffer to live in the midst of such people is his question. How can the holy uh, tolerate the sinful? To whom thus Michael, doubt not but that sin will reign among them as of thee begot, and therefore was law given them to evince their natural pravity, depravity by stirring up sin against law to fight, that when they see law can discover sin, that is, show it as sin, but not remove, save by those shadowy expiations weak, the blood of bulls and goats, they may conclude some blood more precious must be paid for man, just for unjust, that in such righteousness to them by faith imputed, they may find justification towards God and peace of conscience, which the law by ceremonies cannot appease, nor man the moral part perform, and not performing cannot live. Right, that's what Moses says in Deuteronomy at the end. He says, if you do these things, you will live. And so the law is there to show us the need for the Messiah and to show us the depravity of our sin and in a sense to show us the contours of sin as much as anything else and the need for atonement. Very, imperf very important uh, passage here. So law appears imperfect and but given with purpose to resign them in full time up to a better covenant, disciplined from shadowy types to truth, from flesh to spirit, from imposition of strict laws to free acceptance of large grace, from servile fear to filial, works of law to works of faith. What's the difference between servile fear and filial fear? The, the word filial refers to a son. A servant is somebody who fears his master, but the master may not even love his servant. He may hate his servant, but he's, he, he, he owns him um, and rules over him. He may be very harsh. A son, when he's corrected by his father, knows his father loves him. And so he, what the son does that the slave does not is he, he doesn't want to displease his father. He, he obeys uh, out of a desire not to break his father's heart, out of love. The motivation is love. That's what he, that is desire. That, so that's, that's filial fear, works of laws to works of faith. And therefore shall not Moses, though of God highly beloved, being but the minister of law, his, papal in, his people into Canaan leave. But Joshua, whom the Gentiles, Jesus call, his name and office bearing, who, shall, who quell the adversary serpent and bring back through the world's wilderness, long wandered man, safe to eternal paradise of rest. So Joshua is actually the type of Christ. He's named after Joshua, right? It's, Moses, the law will not take you to the promised land. Yeshua will. Joshua, he, he will be the one. And he will quell the adversary serpent and bring back through the world's wilderness long wandered man safe to eternal paradise of rest. Meanwhile, they in their earthly Canaan placed long time shall dwell and prosper. But when sins national interrupt their public peace, provoking God to raise them enemies, from whom as oft he saves them penitent, by judges first, then under kings, of whom the second, both for piety renowned and puissant deeds, a promise shall receive irrevocable, that his regal throne forever shall endure. The like shall sing all prophecy, that of the royal stock of David, so I name this king, shall rise a son, the woman's seed to thee foretold. Foretold to Abraham, as in whom shall trust all nations, and to kings foretold of kings the last, for of his reign shall be no end. 
But first, a long succession must ensue. And his next son for wealth and wisdom famed the clouded ark of God till then intense wandering shall in a glorious temple enshrine. Such follow him as shall be registered, part good, part bad, of bad the longer scroll, whose foul idolatries and other faults heaped to the popular sum will so incense God as to leave them and expose their land, their city, his temple and his holy ark with all his sacred things, a scorn and prey to that proud city whose high walls thou sawest left in confusion, Babylon thence called. There in captivity he lets them dwell in the land of Shinar, right? That's where Babylon comes up, arises right around the Tower of Babel. That's where they're schlepped. That's where Daniel and his friends are, right? Right in the middle of the uh, city that is marked by people hostile to God. There in captivity, he lets them dwell the space of 70 years, then brings them back, remembering mercy and his covenant sworn to David, established as the days of heaven, returned from Babylon by leave of kings, their lords, whom God disposed. The house of God, they first re-edify and for a while in mean estate live moderate till grown in wealth and multitude factious they grow but first among the priests dissension springs men who attend the altar and should most endeavor peace their strife pollution brings upon the temple itself at last they seize the scepter and regard not david's sons then lose it to a stranger At that the true anointed King Messiah might be born barred of his right. Yet at his birth, a star unseen before in heaven proclaims him come and guides the Eastern sages who inquire his place to offer incense, myrrh and gold as place of birth. A solemn angel tells to simple shepherds keeping watch by night. They gladly thither haste and by a choir of squadroned angels hear his carol sung. A virgin is his mother, but his sire, the power of the Most High. He shall ascend the throne hereditary and bound his reign with earth's wide bounds, his glory with the heavens. Now, what he does here in just a few lines is what he expansively deals with in his Nativity Ode, which is to announce uh, Christus uh, Pantocrator, the, the Almighty has come, the ruler of all things. Um, but that is, note now he goes directly from, <laughs> from David all the way to the, uh, David's son. He ceased discerning Adam with such joy surcharged as had light grief been dewed with, in tears without the vent of words, which these he breathed. O prophet of glad tidings, finisher of utmost hope, now Clear I understand what oft my steadiest thoughts have searched in vain. Why our great expectation should be called the seed of woman. Virgin mother, not the seed of man. Right? The seed of woman. Now I know why it's that. The seed of woman. Virgin mother, hail, high in the love of heaven. Yet from my loins shalt thou, sh thou shalt proceed, and from thy womb the Son of God most high. So God with man unites. Needs must the serpent now his capital bruise expect with mortal pain. Say where and when their fight, what stroke shall bruise the victor's heel? Because he's already heard that prophecy, that oracle. And now I know it was called, why it was called the son of woman or the seed of the woman, not the seed of man. Now I know why. Because it's not going to be a, a man who bears this seed, but rather God. To whom thus Michael, Dream not of their fight as of a duel or the local wounds of head or heel. Not therefore joins the son manhood to Godhead with more strength to foil thy enemy, nor so is overcome Satan, whose fall from heaven a deadlier bruise disabled not to give thee thy death's wound, which he who comes thy savior shall recure, not by destroying Satan, but his works in thee and in thy seed. Nor can this be, but by fulfilling that which thou didst want, obedience to the law of God, imposed on penalty of death, and suffering death, the penalty of thy transgressions due, and due to theirs which out of thine will grow. 
so only can high justice rest apate, the substitutionary atonement. As man's substitute, man, God, the uh, uh, God uh, incarnate, a sinless man will bear the sins that he did not commit, but we did for our sins. So only can high justice rest repaid. The law of God exact he shall fulfill both by obedience and by love, though love alone shall fulfill the law. Thy punishment he shall endure by coming in the flesh to a reproachful life and cursed death, proclaiming life to all who shall believe in his redemption, and that his obedience imputed becomes theirs by faith. His merits to save them, not their own, though legal works. For this he shall live hated, be blasphemed, seized on by force, judged, and to death condemned, a shameful and accursed, nailed to the cross by his own nation, slain for bringing life. But to the cross he nails thy enemies. There's, here's the twist. But to the cross he nails thy enemies, the law that is against thee and the sins of all mankind. With him they're crucified. Never to hurt them more who rightly trust in this his satisfaction. So he dies, but soon revives. Death over him no power shall long usurp. Ere the third dawning light return, the stars of morn shall see him rise out of his grave. Fresh is the dawning light, thy ransom paid which man from death redeems. His death for man, as many as offered life, neglect not. And the benefit embrace by faith, not void of works. This godlike act annuls thy doom. The death thou shouldst have died, in sin forever lost from life, this act shall bruise the head of Satan, crush his strength, defeating death, sin and death, his two main arms. Now, so his two main arms, now they're presented as his, his means of uh, crushing mankind. And fix far deeper in his head their stings, then temporal death shall bruise the victor's heel or theirs whom he redeems, a death-like sleep, a gentle wafting to a mortal life. Nor after resurrection shall he stay longer on earth than certain times to appear to his disciples, men who in, in his life had followed him. To them shall leave in charge to teach all nations what of him they learned and his salvation. Uh, and his salvation, where was this? Uh, them who shall believe baptizing in the profluent stream, the sign of washing them from guilt of sin to life, pure, and in mine prepared, if so befall, for death, like that which the Redeemer died, all nations they shall teach. For from that day, not only to the sons of Abraham's loins salvation shall be preached, but to the sons of Abraham's faith, wherever through the world. So in his seed, all nations shall be blessed. Then to the heaven of heavens he shall ascend with victory, triumphing through the air over his foes and thine. There shall surprise the serpent, prince of air, and dragon chains through all his realm, and there confounded leave. Then enter into glory. And resume his seat at God's right hand. Exalted high above all, na high above all names in heaven, and thence shall come when this world's dissolution shall be ripe with glory and power to judge both quick and dead, to judge the unfaithful dead, but to reward his faithful and receive them into bliss, whether in heaven or earth, for then the earth shall all be paradise, far happier place than this of Eden and far happier days. So the, fr the three parts here of Adam's instruction match the three drops that are clearing his eyes back in uh, uh, chapter 11, uh, verse 416. Uh, at, the first was at, the, at noontime, the sixth hour. Uh, the, the second is likened to the great uh, historical cycle, the world's great period, uh, the six ages of man um, that is here. And now we get the third uh, phase here. Uh, different phases, but at any rate, the, uh, 
the angel speaks, the archangel Mikhail, Mikhail and then pause, so at, as at the world's great period, and our sire replete with joy, so full of joy. And wonder thus replied, O oh, goodness infinite, goodness immense, that all this good of evil shall produce, and evil turn to good, more wonderful than that which by creation first brought forth, light out of darkness. Full of doubt I stand, whether I should repent me now of sin by me done and occasioned, or rejoice much more, that, that much more good thereof shall spring. To God more glory, more good will to men from God, and over wrath grace shall abound. So he understands the gospel, that it's better news. It's not just good news, it's better than the good that was originally pronounced to Adam. It's that much better. And so the question is, should I remain in my sins so that God, even more goodness can come out of it? It's the sort of thing that uh, Paul addresses in Romans, right? Well, then should we go on sinning, that grace may abound. But say, if our deliverer up to heaven must reascend, what will betide the few his faithful, left among the unfaithful herd, the enemies of truth? Who then shall guide his people? Who defend? Will they not deal worse with his followers than with him they dealt? Be sure they will, said the angel. But from heaven he to his own a comforter will send. The promise of the Father, who shall dwell his spirit within them, and the law of faith working through love upon their hearts shall write, to guide them in all truth, and also arm with spiritual armor, able to resist Satan's assaults and quench his fiery darts. What man can do against them? Not afraid, though to the death. Against such cruelties with inward consolations recompensed, and oft supported so as shall amaze their proudest persecutors. For the Spirit poured first on his apostles, whom he sends to evangelize the nations, then on all baptized, shall them with wondrous gifts and do to speak all tongues and do all miracles, as did their Lord before them. Thus they win great numbers of each nation to receive with joy the tidings brought from heaven. At length their ministry performed and race well run, their doctrine and their story written left, they die. So this is the inscripturation. Now he's talking about, now it's all written down. But in their room, as they forewarn, wolves shall succeed for teachers. Grievous wolves, who all the sacred mysteries of heaven to their own vile advantages shall turn of lucre and ambition and the truth with superstitions and traditions taint left only in those written words, records pure, though not but by the spirit understood. Then shall they seek to avail themselves of names, places, and titles, and with these to join secular power, though feigning still to act by spiritual, to themselves appropriating the Spirit of God promised alike and given to all believers. And from that pretense, spiritual laws by carnal power shall force on every conscience, laws which none shall find left them unenrolled, or what the spirit within shall in the heart engrave. What will they then but force the spirit of grace itself and bind his consort liberty? What but unbuild his living temples, built by faith to stand, their own faith, not another's? For on earth, who against faith and conscience can be heard infallible? So now he's talking about Christian liberty and not presuming. A, a standard as was happening in England um, uh, of uniformity in the church without um, a, a profession of faith. Yet many will presume whence heavy persecution shall arise on all who in the worship persevere of spirit and truth. The rest, far greater part, will deem in outward rites and specious forms religion satisfied. Truth shall retire bestruck with slanderous darts and works of faith rarely be found. So shall the world go on, to good malignant, to bad men benign, under her own weight groaning, till the day appear of respiration to the just, and vengeance to the wicked, at return of him so lately promised to thy aid the woman's seed. Obscurely then foretold, now amplier known, thy Savior and thy Lord, 
last in the clouds from heaven to be revealed in glory of the Father, to dissolve Satan with this perverted world, then raised from the conflagrant mass, purged and refined, new heavens, new earth, ages of endless date, founded in the righteousness and peace and love, to bring forth fruits, joy, and eternal bliss. He ended. Famous passage, he ended. And thus Adam last replied, How soon hath thy prediction, seer blessed, measured this transient world, the race of time, till time stand fixed? Beyond is all abyss, eternity, whose end no eye can reach. Greatly instructed I shall hence depart, greatly in peace of thought, and have my fill of knowledge, what this vessel can, this vessel can it contain, beyond which was my folly to aspire. Remember, he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Henceforth I learned that to obey is best, and love with fear the only God, to walk as in his presence, ever to observe his providence, and on him soul depend, merciful over all his works, with good still overcoming evil, and by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong, and worldly wise by simply meek. That suffering for truth's sake is fortitude to highest victory, and to the faithful death the gate of life. Taught this by his example, whom I now acknowledge my Redeemer ever blessed. So note, the, he summarizes the instruction that he's been given and, and gives a very concise summary of the, the creed of, uh, of Adam that he'll pass on, how to live. To whom thus the angel ever last replied, this having learned, this having learned, thou hast attained the sum of wisdom, hope no higher, though all the stars thou knewest by name. Remember he was asking about the constellations back in book eight even if you knew all them, and all the ethereal powers, all secrets of the deep, all nature's work of, or works of God in heaven, air, earth, or sea, and all the riches of this world enjoyest, and all the rule. One empire. You're only missing one thing. Only add deeds to thy knowledge. Answerable. Add faith. Add virtue. Patience. Temperance. Add love. By name to come called charity, the soul of all the rest. Then wilt thou not be loath to leave this paradise, but shall possess a paradise within, happier far. Let us descend now. Therefore, from this top of speculation, speculation, they're not speculating, they're looking. They're uh, as in a vision, speculation in the sense of space to see in Latin. For the hour precise exacts are departing hence and see the guards by me encamped on yonder hill expect their motion at whose front a flaming sword in signal remove waves fiercely round. We may no longer stay. Go wake an eve. And I'll carry on here. He ended and, and Eve speaks to him and says, you don't need to tell me. I already know. I found out in a dream. <laughs> um, and Eve is, Eve is pleased <laughs> and she is consoled and she says, although by me all is lost, such favor I, I and worthy am vouchsafed, by me the promised seed shall all restore. So spake our mother Eve, and Adam heard, well pleased, but answered not. For now too nigh the archangel stood, and from the other hill to their fixed station, all in bright array the cherubim descended. On the ground, gliding meteorous, as evening mist risen from a river or the marish glides and gathers ground fast at the laborer's heel, homeward returning. High in front advanced, the brandished sword of God before them blazed, fierce as a comet, which with torrid heat and vapor as the Libyan air a dust began to parch that temperate clime. Whereat, in either hand, in either hand, the hastening angel caught our lingering parents and to the eastern gate led them direct and down the cliff as fast to the subjected plain, then disappeared. They, looking back, all the eastern side beheld of paradise, so late their happy seat. Waved over by that flaming brand, the gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms, some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest and providence their guide. They 
hand in hand with wandering steps and slow through Eden took their solitary way. Note the solitude at the end. The society, the solitude, the hand in hand. Uh, replicating and, and, and uh, alluding back to previous passages. But there, note the, the, the beautiful symmetries uh, throughout the entirety of the account. They leave with the paradise within. They leave paradise with paradise within. Consoled by the uh, story that they've been told of a redeemer that lives, that dies for them and will give them a greater life. And all of their wickedness and sin will result in more grace and more goodness. It's a, it's a great vision. Anyway, that's called Paradise Lost. Um, and it, it, it has a, a, a grace note to it from the beginning to end. Uh, we'll go to Paradise return, Regained next time and see what comes of that. 